Okay, hello everyone, and welcome to the SoFlow Pojo Flash launch for February 2024. Uh, my name is Francine Witt. I'm here in New York City, and our editor in chief, Michael Mackin O'Mara, is manning the Zoom tonight for us. So um, we have a great bunch of readers, and uh, I'll be reading stories for people who aren't here. I'm not going to read the whole stories for them. Uh, but I'll read parts of it unless they're kind of short. But what I usually do to start off is read just to warm it up, you know, warm up the airwaves here. Um, is read a story by another writer. This is from Flash Fiction. Everybody know who, who's in the Flash Fiction world knows this, right? This is, I don't know if this is showing up backwards, but... Um, it's the original Norton anthology of flash fiction. And, um, just, uh, I think this was back in the nineties or something when flash fiction was just a baby and, um, yeah. And really wonderful step in here. If you don't have it, try to order it because it's a great book to have. And so here's a, here's a story that I, I always come back to. Uh, I really love this story. And in fact, I even wrote to the fellow who wrote this, Fred Lee Braun, um, to tell him how much I loved his story. I, I I found him on Facebook. And it's like, I must have thought it was a stalker or something. But that's okay, you know. <laughs> it's good stalking. Okay, this is called Water. She touches his hair by the river. I am in an... I am in our apartment working. Her hand moves down his back. I empty the trash and unclog the kitchen sink. His former girlfriends have turned into lesbians. I take the key to his apartment, which he gave me so I could water his plants during the summer. He bends his kissing face to hers. I walk over to his apartment just two blocks away. Their legs dangle in the river. I unlock the door and bolt it behind me. The room smells of feet and stale ashtrays. In the kitchen is a gas stove. I turn it on without lighting it. Down by the river is a flock of geese, which they admire while holding hands. Soon, he will take her back to his apartment. Soon, they will lie there lighting cigarettes. I relock the apartment and slip into the street. The air smells of autumn, burnt. In the sky, birds are leading each other south. I know there is nothing left between us, that she looks at me each morning as if I were something interrupting her life. Love that story. <laughs> okay. Now... We're going to hear from our first reader, um, and Tina Berry. Uh, Tina Berry is the author of Beautiful Raft and Mallflower. Her writing can be found in Sofla Pojo, the Best Small Fiction's 2020 Spotlighted Story, and 2016 Tramps and 2016 Tramp Set A Minor, the Maryland Literary Review, Review Rattle. Verse Daily, the American Poetry Journal, One Art, a Journal of Poetry, and elsewhere. Tina is a three-time Pushcart Prize nominee and has several Best of the Net and Best Microfiction nods. Tina Berry. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Francine. Thanks, Michael. And thanks for everybody for being here. I'm excited to hear you read. Um, I'm going to start with uh, uh, one of the pieces called Zeus Again, all of these pieces are going to be in my upcoming book, I Tell Henrietta. Um, okay. Zeus again. Something about the guy in the bar bothered me. He grinned too broadly as if my comments charmed him, leaned in too close as I spoke, was too easy in my company. I said yes, though, when he invited me to a Halloween party. Going through my mother's closet weeks before, I discovered an old caftan in shades of neon rainbow and welcomed the opportunity to swish around in it. 
On the night of the party, I opened the door to discover him dressed as an enormous swan. The costume seemed so lifelike, the eye black, glittering, feathers a flutter. Whoa, I said, and tried to back away, but his wings closed around me, one webbed foot wedged in the door. So that's that, um, and this is, thank you, this is Vanessa. I tell Henrietta about a lover, much older than me, with the library of a great scholar, a surprising perk from a man who sold girdles in the garment district. His room, 15 foot ceilings, oak shelves groaning with tomes, a ladder waiting on wheels. In the corner, a desk of mellow mahogany sat grand on a Persian rug. I awoke in his bed, urgent to peruse his collection. On entering the room, one book glowed green. When I reached for it, a photo dislodged, fluttered to the floor. A woman stared. Currents of blue veins coursed as if she were a river contained in spume-pale skin. Ample hips tapered into a whirlpool. What was beneath the water's surface, I didn't know. A glittering fishtail, a shell pearlized pink. Turning the photo over, a name, Vanessa. I shook him gently from sleep. Tell me, I said. Mm. Thank you. Um, this is, I tell Henrietta about Rusty. I tell Henrietta about Rusty, who wanted to tattoo his name above my navel, like all his other girlfriends. Rusty, like that was going to happen. Life had already drawn on my skin. The silver thread of a cesarean scar hiked up in one corner. He called it my second smile. And a more dramatic mark crisscrossed below a hip bone as if the doctor had sewn with rope instead of thread. But rusty? Fenders rusted after too many snowfalls. Cast iron skillets, the kind I fried old Rusty's eggs in, rusted. When he ran his hand over my belly and said, Come on, babe, do it for me. I thought, oh, hell no. This guy won't stick around long enough for the ink to dry. But that's that. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, and my last one is Lily World. Two hours from suburbia to heaven. Gasoline stinks up the bus terminal. Cabbies swerve, flip each other off. Horns, painful music. Mother's cheeks pinkin. The museum's revolving door whooshes us into marble and glass. Crowds of women in wide wool skirts, scarlet lipstick, cashmere. And then Monet's lilies, ponds of water lilies, whole conventions of lilies, frills of lavender, shimmering sage, and so many blues more blues than an ocean or a sky. Pistols exhaling, petals unfurling, a floral st strip tease. We try for words, but can only make sound. Oh, and mmm. We don't believe in God. Can't tell you what spiritual means, but that room, those flowers. That's it. That's beautiful, beautiful, Tina. Thank I you. love how visual your writing is. Thank you. It's really Thank beautiful. You. Thank you. Thank you, Tina Barry. Thank you very Thank much. You. Um, and you. as I had, you know, I wrote to most of you um, who are reading tonight, you can read certainly your piece from here or from whatever you wrote here and something else. And um, we have some time. And I put the reading order in the chat, I hope everybody sees that. Um, I'll be reading for some of the people who aren't here. I'm only going to read a little bit if it's a long story. So um, 
it won't be the full, you know, six minutes for each of them. So it won't take quite as long as it seems. Um, anyway, so I'm I'm going to read for John Yohe. Um, born in Puerto Rico, John Yohe has worked as a wildland fighter, wilderness ranger, and fire lookout. Best of the Net nominee times two, notable essay list for Best American Essays 2021, 20, 22, 23. And um, he's also apparently see John's words in our poetry issue. Um, and uh, just an, what a segue to say, welcome Judy Ireland. One of our one of the Soflo Pojo uh, uh, poetry editors. Welcome, so nice of you to be here, um, Judy Ireland. So I'm going to read John Yohe's um, story. What she learned from her mother that you don't have to settle for everything, anything ever. If your husband won't grow with you, you can leave him. If you don't like your job, you can leave it. You can leave it if you don't like being a parent. You can even leave if you don't like being a parent. She learned how to live poor and survive on part-time jobs and that, and when there is money, you should spend it and enjoy. She learned how to cook for two or one, but that it's okay to just get pizza. She learned to be naive, to expect people to, de to be decent, to be, and to be angry when they're not, and to carry that anger all her life. She learned that most effective way to hurt some, the most effective way to hurt someone and transfer your anger is to write a letter so you don't have to talk face to face or even on the phone. She learned to follow her interests, but that's how to never learn anything in depth and still pretend to be an expert. She learned to love books and find her friends and teachers in them. She learned to be okay with doing things other people, especially relatives, disapprove of, and that she can get on a plane, fly to another country and survive, live even. She learned how to move and keep moving and how to be alone. Johnny Open. A good story. Okay. Um, next, we're going to hear from the lovely Jane Martin. Um, Jane Martin is a recipient of Vestal Review's Vera Award for Flash Fiction and the author of Tender Cuts, a collection of microfiction from Vine Leaves Press. And the Daddy Chronicles, memoir of a fatherless daughter from Whiskey Tig Books, both wonderful books. Um, she lives in California with her dog, Miss Pickles, and her horse, Luna, The Dreams of Living in Paris. I do. Jane, Jane Martin .writer com, Twitter at Jane underscore Martin. Jane Martin. Thank you. Thank you. So fun to be here. Um. I'm going to start with a piece that I wrote last year. No, I wrote this in 2022, and it was published last year. This was the one you published. Um, and it's called Mayflowers. My father was a young American alone in Paris, out to follow in the footsteps of Hemingway and Faulkner, while seeking a voice uniquely his own all his possessions stuffed into a well-traveled backpack. He slept in the cheapest of hostels or sometimes on the floor of a bistro where he could earn a few francs washing dishes. She was a beautiful French girl, a seller of flowers in her family stand near the cathedral Notre Dame. He came to the outdoor cafe across from her each morning stretching his savings for a boiled egg or a roll, a café au lait. There he was allowed to sit for hours, his notebook open, a pencil now worn down to a stub from words written, scratched out, written again. They had noticed each other, exchanged discreet glances, always turning away before their eyes could actually meet. He felt foolish in his desire to speak to her. What could an impoverished young writer have to offer such a girl, even if he could find the words in her language? It was May 1st, Labor Day in France, Fête du Trovail. And as was tradition, everywhere the scent of Lily of the Valley, Mayflowers, as they were called, carried or worn on a lapel, caught the early breeze off the Seine, on this morning, 
words failing him once again. The last tiny bit of lead fell from his pencil, and he closed his notebook. He would return to America. He would go to work in his father's factory. He would admit his foolishness. Then there she was, standing before him, carrying a sprig of tiny white bell-shaped flowers, which she laid across his notebook, and beside it, a new pencil. And though they've heard the stories countless times, when my children and I visit him today, the first thing they always ask is, tell us again how you met Grandma. Um, this one is from this new issue. And it's called Slipping Away. No one seemed to notice when she began losing adjectives. A blue car became a car the color of the sky, which was fine unless the sky was gray that day. Sometimes her daughter would say, oh, you mean blue, mom? And she would get annoyed and say, I mean what I said, in a tone a lot harsher than she intended. Nouns were the next to go. When her mind would not give up the word for kettle and she had to ask for the thing that cooks water or phone began, became the thing you talk through, her family began to become concerned. When her apartment manager found her in the hallway, naked and dripping water, looking for the thing that dries you off, it was decided she could no longer live alone. Soon, Mouths from which she'd wiped cookie crumbs and cheeks from which she'd kissed away tears no longer held memory. And though these people visited her often and were always very kind, she missed her children. Um, and the last piece, I'm actually going to read from Tender Cuts. And this one is called The Elephant Roars. No one wanted to talk about the elephant in the room, except for the children, who would talk of nothing else. We had adopted it when it was a baby, when we believed we could have no children of our own, when we believed our love for one another wasn't enough. The toddler snoozes in the curve of its trunk, while the twins cling to its sturdy legs, sucking their thumbs well into their teens. You lie on the sofa, clutching the remote, only your feet visible under the pachyderm's massive belly. I sit at my computer, chatting with wolves. The elephant roars, but nobody hears it. Oh, Thank you so much. Beautiful, Jane. Thank Jane you. Martin. It's just Thank beautiful. Uh, very touching, poignant. Um, Okay, so I'm going to be reading. Uh, Gary Fink was supposed to be here, but he had a family emergency. So he asked me to read part, part of his story. Um, so <clears throat> I'll just read two paragraphs and you can read the rest of the story in the issue. Gary Fink's Splash Collection, The Corridors of Longing, was published by Pelicanesis Press in 2022. His newest book is The Mayan Syndrome, a memoir and essays, Mad Hat Press 2023. Its lead essay after the three moon era was reprinted in Best American Essays 2020. He is co-editor of their annual, <clears throat> the annual anthology Best Microfiction. He and Meg Pokris um, are the uh, engine there of our wonderful Best Microfiction. So, um, so Gary Fink is is quite a, a presence in the in the fiction uh, short story and and now Flash World. So. I'll just read a little bit of his story. Su summiting. Not exactly Mount as as I'm sorry, not exactly Mount Everest, but we don't have a hundred thousand plus to spend. What some people call a bargain, because summiting there is singular and loaded with bragging rights. Trust me, this one is semi-famous, so snow capped, at least in July. And for sure we're waiting in line to summit. Just like the Everett, Everest elitists, when a wealthy mountaineer panics at one of the dangerous parts. 
Maybe you've seen that video. Some goggle-wearing adventure seeker stepped into a, a bulky outfit, balking at a reach and swing and hold or else die a moment. A Sherpa coaxing, fear forever documented. My wife keeps saying, not to sound sour grapey, she calls it heartless. But I plan to post a video for my body cam to prove we never hesitated when, when climbing a risky patch. Right now, the camera is off because there's nothing to corroborate but other summiteers here where breath comes hard and discomfort easy. My wife, the bean counter, says there are 68 in front of us, and I know not to challenge. Spending less, we expected to wait, but our foot traffic back our foot traffic is clogged like Black Friday at the Miracle Mall this year, the year we were married. And I'll stop there. Uh, I hope that grabs your attention. <laughs> and you can check that out in the issue. Gary Fink. Next, we have Colleen O'Hara. And um, Colleen O'Hara has been published in the Fourth River Marathon Literary Review, South Florida Poetry Journal, and elsewhere. Um, her story, Words for a Puppet, has been published in Intermissions, an anthology from Grattan Street Press. She has an MFA in fiction from the New School. Find her on Twitter at Colleen O'Hara and online at ColleenOHara.com. Your story was the Illumination of Light story, was that? Yes, but it's what I published before, A Brief History of Illumination. Yeah. That I, I've told you this many times. That's just one of like the best stories I've ever seen come in. So I loved oh, thank it. Thank you so much. Loved I it. really appreciate it. But yeah, I really appreciate world, it. Yeah. In a world of stories that I, I love. I love all the stories. And that one just like, it just, it was one of those stories that just jumped off the page at me. So yeah, it was pretty good. So let's hear from Colleen O'Hara. Okay, thank you so much. And thank you, South Florida, Florida Poetry Journal, for all of your uh, love and support. Uh, so I am having internet issues. So if I cut in and out, yeah. um, it may create a new piece of fiction. We're going to call it Zoom Erasure Fiction. Uh, so uh, I'm going to be reading Heliotropism. Uh, so if you want to follow along um, online in case I do cut in and out, uh, just to let you know. Um, okay, so uh, this is heliotropism. One, all the light I cannot hold. Sunshine spills through my fingertips. <laughs> directly at the sun, they said. Listen, not directly. I want to believe in it. I want to believe in the sun. I have no proof. Light seeps through the door jam, the luminosity of morning. Two, Remember this, remember this. When I am 22, the sky is not the sky, the ocean is not the ocean. At the break of dawn, I cannot see the division of sky and sea, I only see color. I believe it starts in this moment here. Cameras cannot capture the colors. Memory is all that can remain. Inside the horizon, I understand that not Remember this. I walk to the beach, the edge of the world. The land begins and ends here at my feet. The sun slowly collapses, tearing the sky along with it. Nearing the final crest of light, there is a bloody demicircle on the waves. I stand until the burning blaze scorches me and the water turns black with time. Black hole settles on sea and sky. I stare, but I feel it sucking me in. I run away. I think part of me was taken. When I was young, I lived for sunrises. I wanted to see days ignite. How many sunsets and sunrises have there been? Plenty. Not enough. One day the sun will fill us. That is not today. Today is the day of the sleeping sun. Remember this, remember this. I can feel the sun. I know it is there. My eyes are shut. I do not need them to be open. I want to feel what is visible. I want to feel what is obscured. I feel it happening. The sun rising, the sun setting. I feel it. I believe it. I see the sun as it rises. I see the sun as it sleeps. I see, I see, I see. Three. 
The dying light is warmest, final etching of sun into skin. Before the shadow of night, the evening breeze blows. Still, the pale light persists, burning hotly against the void, the absence of itself. I feel it on my shoulder, that dogged determination, the tenacity of touch. It doesn't want to be forgotten. I do not wish to forget. I turn my face like a plant, twisting towards the sun. I crave the light. I need it. I want it. I force myself to remain, to feel for one moment. This moment is the only moment that matters. All other moments are oblivion. My eyes cannot hold the light. They are closed, useless portals of nothing. My skin clutches the illumination, traps it in the nerves. Signals are sent to my brain, electric codes that say, this is the sun, this is the sun, this is the sun, over and over, a different relay now, cold, cold, cold. I cannot interpret the message. What is cold? The air? Me? Am I cold? I don't like the cold. I like the warm. I want warmth above all else. I reach out my hand. I am touching cool at been extinguished. I recall the previous moment. I remember the sun. I remember the warm sun. I hold on to the memory now, right at the fall of night. This seems critical, although I cannot say why. Living things crave sun. They need it. They want it. I am a living thing. I crave it. I need it. I want it. The moment fades from me, from my fingers, from my mind. What is it that I desire? I forget. I forget. I do not know what to search for in the night. I do not hold anything here. In the darkness, I let go. Thank you. Oh, that is brilliant, Colleen. Thank you so much. And I love Zoom erasure. <laughs> That's classic. I love that. So thank you so much. It's been it's been an interesting evening of Zoom um thing. So uh, I kind of love it. It's kind of real, you know. Okay, I'm going to, that's Colleen O'Hara. Um, and you can read her story without the Zoom erasure online in the issue. Um, I'm going to read for Kelly Short Borges, who's, uh, I think she's at a bachelor a bachelorette party for her daughter who's about to get married. So uh, that's a pretty good excuse, I thought, you know. Um, so Kelly Short Borges writes essays, short stories, and flash fiction from her home in Phoenix, Arizona. Her work appears or is forthcoming in Gone Long, to home literary to home a literary review, Flash Boulevard, Cleaver, Moon Park Review, The Pen Review, multiple anthologies, and elsewhere. Kelly is a best of the net, best microfiction, and best small fictions nominee. Often you can find her at favorite local bookstores where she gobbles up lemon cake in books in equal measure. She's currently working on her first novel. Okay, Kelly Short Bridges. What I did, what I did, why I did what I did after work behind Titty McGee's. Because my job was the only job in our small town, the only job for a woman like me, because my job was to parade as little Bo Peep, to parade, was to smile all blank and blue eyes, was to wear a short skirt, was to wear bloomers, was to wear a pink bow, a pink bow like a beacon, a bow like a present, a bow like a girl, was to offer to help men find what they've lost, what time has stolen, what time has erased, what to serve them jack, what was to serve them jack, another round to jack, another round to giggle, to flounce, to trifle with trouble. To pretend it was okay to grab my ass, to pretend it was okay to finger my bow, to pretend I liked it in the parking lot after, to pretend I liked it so they'd slip me a 50 so I could pay rent, so I could buy pampers, so I could buy food for my daughter, to pretend so social workers wouldn't take her, so I could send her to college, so she could earn a degree, so she might be something, so she might, so she could be something, so she could be something better than me. Kelly Short Borges. And I love the title, What I Did, Why I Did What I Did After Work Behind Titty McGee's. I just wanted to say that. <laughs> um, next, we're going to hear from Sally Simon. Sally Simon, Z here is uh, the pronouns. Here. In the Catskills, lives in the Catskills of New York. Here, writing, I, 
I'm not familiar with these pronouns. Handwriting appeared in Citron Review, Emerge Lit, Raw Lit, and elsewhere when not writing. Z's either traveling the world or stabbing people with here pay. Read more <laughs> at sallysimonwriter.com. Forgive me, Sally, is that German Z here? No, it's um it's pronouns that are basically fluid. Okay. Gender fluid. Got it. To make a long story short. Yeah, thank you. Sure. Um so to warm up, because I don't do this very often, I'm gonna read a 100 word um story that was long listed for Retreat West's monthly microfiction a couple months ago. It's called A Beginner's Guide to Displacement. Callie raises her hand long after other students give up. Mrs. Wilson announces, write again. Later, Callie will sit alone at the lunch table working out an equation. Even later, she'll graduate Kuma Sum Laude in engineering, get hired by a top firm and spend her weekends calculating power output and friction loss. On Mondays, she'll sit at a conference table. The project leader will ask a question. Callie will raise her hand. Her male coworkers will call out answers. She'll accept a beer after work, rebuff sexual advances, and wonder what to do when the numbers don't add up. So the piece that was in um, Sojo um, was written in a Kathy Fish workshop, and we needed to actually use this Malaysian poetic form as inspiration. It's called Pantum. I had never heard of it, but it's called This Little Piggy Went to Market. This little piggy went to market with her mother to buy eggs and bread. Little did she know eggs aren't the only things that can crack. There's more than one way to kill a pig. The slaughterhouse is the quick and painless version of this story. This little piggy wasn't so lucky. This little piggy stayed home. Little did she know not all homes are safe. Mothers can crack like eggs and they can't be fixed. Staying home means hiding before Sunday dinner. Sometimes hiding can last for days or weeks. Staying at home is not the quick and painless version of this story. This little piggy prayed someday she'd be found. This little piggy had roast beef on her plate for Sunday dinner, never asking from where it came. Little did she know there's more than one way to kill a cow. Mothers can overcook beef and it can't be fixed. Throwing the leftovers in the trash is the best version of this story. This little piggy tried to have none, but she was oh so hungry. Sometimes this little piggy had none. Days and weeks went by and still no roast beef on her plate for Sunday dinner. She was oh so hungry. Little did she know starving is just as bad as slaughter. There's more than one way to kill a pig. There is no version of this story that isn't painless. For days and weeks, this little piggy cried. This little piggy cried, wee, all the way home before she remembered not all homes are safe, that mothers can crack like eggs, that in this version of the story, it's only a matter of time. Wonderful. And I have one more if you want. Sure. I was really proud of this story because it was um, only a couple months after I started writing again, after like a 20 year hiatus. And it was in After the Pause, which is now defunct mm -hmm. in spring of 21. It's called The Slingshot. I press my cheek against the marble slab of Rita Hester beloved daughter. I cower and wait. Crickets chirrup. I want to join them to cry for help, but gritty earth lingers in my mouth. 
I swoosh saliva around in Hako Lugi. A vaporous cloud escapes, a beacon. Bam! A rock slams the headstone. Sorry, Rita. Whirr! A second stone careens overhead and dives to the grass behind me. The harvest moon lights a path to the mausoleum. I push off the grave like it's a starting block and take off. There she is, get her. I zigzag through an obstacle course of granite slabs. My feet slip on wet grass. I throw my hand downward to balance myself. Whack, a direct hit to my upper arm. Throbbing radiates up my shoulder to my neck where it takes root. I swerve around a bush and make for the mausoleum. The taunting amplifies. You can't get away, tranny. Don't you want to eat more dirt? You run like a girl, Carl. She is a girl, dickwad. A cacophony of boyish cackles saturate the night. My tormentors chant Carl like it's a curse word. The shadow from a nearby limb paints a crooked finger on the ground. I sprint to the tree and take cover behind the trunk. Thump, bark explodes at my feet. It's maybe 15 feet to the concrete behemoth. My chest feels like a clenched fist under my binder. I'm dizzy as, a, as I propel myself to the ground. I dig my elbows into the soft earth and crawl forward like a soldier. Where is she? Don't know, I can barely see. I swear she was heading for that tree. Load your biggest stones, boys, on the count of three. Smack, a rock strikes my lower back. The blow extends down my leg, electrifying my toes. I lose my focus and grunt. Did you hear that? Sounded like a pig. It came from over there. I wriggle forward. A war medallion hangs from a thick wire jutting from a grave. I rip the rod free. Dirt clings to the jagged spike. I tuck it under me and cradle it close. There's huffing and puffing above me. Something plops beside my head. My neck kinks when I turn to see what it is. A wooden Y handle with twisted rubber supporting a leather pocket. The spirit of David overtakes me, commands me to stand my ground. Three zips occur in rapid succession. Turn her over, boys. Time to show Carl what a real man looks like. I clutch the spike, prepared for action. Goliath is about to get his. Wow. <laughs> thank, th thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Sally Simon. That was um, just uh, breathtaking, really. Um, thank you so much. And it's really um, interesting to, you know, hear the stories read out loud, too. Um, and I have my captions on, so I'm reading along, even the ones that um, that I didn't, you know, that weren't in the journal. Like, I can read them at the bottom there as, as we hear them. Um, Okay, uh, we have the next three readers. Um, I'm going to be reading a little bit from them. So I'm going to read just a little bit, uh, just to give you a flavor of, of what it is. Um, because I do, because I love all the stories that are in the, are in the journal. Um, I like to honor them, if, if just briefly. So first we'll hear a little bit from Kirby Wright, who's born and raised in Hawaii. He's guest lecturer at Trinity College in Dublin. Davy Burns Pub, Dublin. Howls from Davy Burns rattle the Duke Street cobbles. Next comes a baritone singing, American pie, in I go. Aroma of fried fish. I scoot past diners spootering, spooning watery chowder to find a seat at the bar. Millennials crowd around a James Joyce portrait. His later years. The bearded singer croons about a levee, drink, and death. Men adopt McGregor personas, swaying the stout. And you can read the rest in the journal. That's Kirby Wright, Davy Jones Pub, Dublin. And next, um, uh, Sumitra Sigum, who was supposed to be here, I thought, 
I don't know if she just had trouble getting in or I'm not sure. But Sumitra Sigam is a Malaysian, Indian, Australian coconut who writes in Naram, Melbourne. She traveled through many spaces, both beautiful and traumatic to get there and writes to make sense of her experiences. She'll be the one in the kitchen making chai. Where's your cardamom? She works in mental health. You can find her in other publication credits on Twitter at Pleomorphic2. And I think uh, the bio is as interesting as, as the story. Um, and I'll just read a little bit of it. The truth of nighttime things. And you worked so hard with your feather light touch. You asked, whispering hot in my ear, how do you like it? You forgot your own needs, focused lantern jawed on me, smile crinkling the corners of your eyes like waves on the sand. And you were the ocean I wanted to drown in, just fall, fall, fall into. But I am a bottom dweller. The mud sucks me in with squelching certainty. And I can't move, can't move. I can't be responsible for what I might do to you. And I'll stop there. Uh, Sumitra Singham, The Truth of Nighttime Things. And the last one that I'm going to read before we move on is Kathy Hoyle. Um, she may be fast asleep. I think she's also, I think she's in the UK, which um, doesn't mean anything, does it, Jude? Because you're here. <laughs> right. Yeah. You're a trooper. That's why, Jude. <laughs> Okay, Kathy Hoyle's stories are published in literary magazines such as The Forge, Lunate, Emerged Literary Journal, Ellipsocene, and Fictive Dream. She's won the Bath Flash Fiction Award and the Retreat West Flash Fiction Award. Other stories have placed in competitions such as the Edinburgh Flash Fiction Award, the Hissack Prize, and the Cambridge Flash Fiction Prize. She was long listed for Wigleaf Top 50 2022 and has had work nominated for the Best Small Fictions, Best Microfictions, and the Pushcart Prize. I'll read a little bit of this. Cockleshell Girl. The girl is a moss-swept rock nestled amongst the others. She knows every one of them, all their curves and crags, generations of ancient fisherwomen in her blood. She's like them, yet not like them. She has dreams, she has notebooks, hidden under pillows, filled with lists of far-off places. She is a cockle-shell girl, hearty and salted, with a flint-eyed resilience the soft sand boys who circle her could only ever dream of. She is rooted here in this place, her grandmothers and great-grandmothers tethered to the cliffside watching her, waiting. She doesn't need them. She doesn't need to see them to know that they are there. And I'll stop there and you can read the rest. It's a beautiful story. That's Kathy Hoyle. And now we're going to return to the people in the room here, um, Pamela Painter. Pam is the award-winning author of five story collections. Her stories have appeared in numerous journals and in the recent anthologies, Flash Fiction America, which is in Norton, Best Microfiction, of 2023 and Best Small Fictions 2023. She has received three Pushcart Prizes and her work has been staged by World Theater in London, New York, and LA. Her story, Doors, has been made into a short film. She lives in Cambridge, Mass. Pamela Painter. Oh, thank you. I'm on. Okay. Um, <clears throat> thanks, Francine. And uh, thank you for all your editing, all the work you put into this. So uh, I'm going to read two stories. The first is called A Private Conversation. My husband kept telling me we need to talk, to have a private conversation that lasts longer than the time it takes us to dress for work or for me to rustle up omelets for a Sunday brunch or for him to open bottles of wine before guests arrive. He kept telling me it wasn't about us, even though I imagined an announcement that he wanted a divorce or at least a separation, giving our transgressions both his and mine. But he said, no, it wasn't that. 
and nothing to do with his law firm. And it wasn't the kids, because once when he said we need to talk, I asked him if he was worried about the kids hanging with the wrong crowd or getting hooked on alcohol or drugs. And he said, no, nothing to do with the kids. I continued to evade that talk, that private conversation by asking what, what was it about? After his suicide, immense regret accompanied my grief that I would never know the subject of that delayed conversation, what he must have agonized over and never said. I should have listened. I could have asked how, how can I keep you here? Francine, I think that's one that you, you're publishing. Yeah, that's it. That's in the uh, it's in the journal. Yep. Yeah. Okay. The, the uh, second one is called feelings. Um, I don't know. My mind has just been taken over by zombies recently. I Lord knows. <laughs> <why. laughs> I think it was there was a line in a Laura a Vandenberg novel that that I just you know made me think about zombies anyway. Called feelings. My roommate is a zombie freak, a theater major. She's taking the course on body craft that teaches zombie movies, moves. Her favorite movies are I Walked with a Zombie and Dawn of the Living Dead. I sit on my bed, sketchbook on my knees and draw her practicing how to stumble and lurch. When I giggle, she says it isn't funny that Hollywood always needs actors who do zombies well. She says it's not all makeup, blood, and gore. She stops mid-lurch and glowers at me. Maybe I'm a zombie, she says. I laugh and point to her posters of Adele, the Kinks, and Taylor Swift. I tell her zombies are nothing like us. They don't read or write, and they can't even walk straight. We're not supposed to walk straight, she says, lurching over to our closet, turning and lurching back. Her arms dangle down loose as a noose. As I sketch her straggly hair, she informs me that next fall, her costume and makeup class is doing two weeks on zombies. When she learns I applied for a new roommate for sophomore year, her feelings are hurt. I try to make a joke of it. Zombies don't have feelings, I say. Her eyes narrow, go dead. She says, so now you're the one out for blood. And then she laughs. <laughs> How many have seen I Walked with a Zombie? Anybody there saw? <laughs> that is so wonderful and so creepy. Anyway. <laughs> oh, thank you so much, Pam. Always wonderful to hear you. Thank you. And, um, um, yeah, I'm going to keep an eye on your zombie fixation. <laughs> um, okay, that that was, of course, Pamela Painter. And um, next I'm going to read a few, uh, uh, few people who are not here. And um, I'll, again, I'll just read a little bit of their stories. L. Mary Harris. L. Mary Harris is... L. Mary Harris's stories have been chosen for the Wigleaf Top 50 and Best Microfiction. She lives in the Ozarks. Follow her at L. Mary Harris and read more of her work, lmaryharris.wordpress.com. Flight pattern. In mid-October, an incisor fell to the ground. I swooped it up along with fallen orchard apples. Branches snagged my new sweater. I told you there was something a little dreamy about this time of year, teetering, dynamic, yielding, something I wish I could capture in a little glass bottle with a diamond-shaped stopper. I bought a sun lamp in either late December or late Jan or early January. Package inserts stated it cured insomnia and despair. It seemed like a tall order, maybe a marketing ploy gone too far. But what is marketing really but hope? I then bought a bag of oranges and, an, and a pineapple, sunshiny fruits, fruits that made the sun lamp feel like that all-inclusive resort in Acapulco. And I'll stop there. You can read the rest online in the journal, L. Mary Harris, Glide Pattern. And Gabrielle Griffiths, I thought, was going to be here as well. So um, 
I will read part of her story. Gabrielle Griffiths is a musician, writer, and multimedia artist. She works as a librarian. Her fiction has been published in Wigleaf, Split Lip, Matchbook, Monkey Bicycle, Cheap Pop, X-Ray, OK Donkey, and elsewhere. Her work has been selected for Best Microfiction 2022 and nominated for Best Small Fictions and the Pushcart Prize. Read more at gabrielgriffiths.com or follow her at G Griffiths. Um, and her story is Trout Lilies. Mr. Nord and I step over a rotting log in the woods. A brook meanders through the trees as sun falls on the water and moss-covered rocks. Mr. Nord is our neighbor. He babysits me after school while my mom is working. Before he moved in, I spent most afternoons by myself. Mom always left frozen dinners and canned pasta for me. I used to do my homework and watch TV by myself, but now Mr. Nord takes me on adventures. We go fishing and find different things to eat in nature. He says microwave pizza isn't food. And I'm going to stop there. That sounds good, right? <laughs> it's inviting. Like, I know you want to go read the rest of that story. Gabrielle Griffiths. I know that I want to read it again. <laughs> um, and then uh, the last one I'm going to read is Christopher Linforth, whose latest book is The Distortions from Horizon Books. 2022. Um, reunion. My girlfriend disappeared in the winter of 95. The following spring, her picture appeared on the side of a milk carton. Her lank hair framed her washed out face. Not at all how I remembered her. She'd had messy braids and a silver nose ring. She always wore a Nirvana t-shirt. She liked to say Kurt wasn't really dead, that he'd moved to Hollywood, changed his name to Brad Pitt. I did, that was an interesting theory. I didn't have any pictures of her myself. In truth, we'd only been on two dates, both times to Mike's hamburgers and devoured chocolate milkshakes and split a large portion of fries. She talked about L.A., maybe finding a job out there, even tracking down the reincarnation of Kurt. We were both 15 at the time, and I hadn't taken her too seriously, and she vanished. I cut out the depressing mugshot of her. I had no idea who'd taken this picture or why her parents had chosen this one and showed it around town. Um, and I'll stop there. And that's um, Christopher Linforth, Reunion. Okay, and I'm um, sure you're going to want to read all of those stories um, in the journal. And our final reader tonight is here, um, Maxie, Jean, Maxie Jane Frazier. And she's a writer, teacher, editor, retired military veteran from Riverside, Washington. Thank you for your service. Her work is forthcoming or has appeared in Booth, Collateral Journal, Scribes, Microfiction, Bending Genres, The Ecrastic Review, The Bath Flash Fiction Anthology, and other places. Maxie Jean holds an MFA from Bennington, writing seminars and co-founded Birch Bark Editing, where she is co-editor for Micro Lit Almanac, Maxie Jane Frazier. Thank you, Francine. I am so delighted and honored to be in this group of people. What amazing pieces we've heard tonight. I thought that I wouldn't read what I had in um, so flow Pojo, uh, and maybe I misunderstood your email, but uh, it does, it doesn't read as well as I wish it did. <laughs> I tried it out loud and said, how about these two new pieces? So the piece in your journal and the first one I'm going to read both emerged in Sarah Freely workshops. And boy, I'm sure you've all been in them, but I oh, recommend yeah. them so she's much. She's great. Yeah. Great stuff. Yeah. <laughs> she's wonderful. Yeah. Um, I just want to say as somebody who had Kurt Cobain in the class ahead of me in my high school, uh, he's probably dead. I'm just going to tell Christopher that. So anyway, <laughs> this piece emerged, I, I just stepped down from the Willa Cather Foundation Board of Governors, and I'm a, I was a Willa Cather scholar in my previous life. <clears throat> and this piece emerged from that passion for her writing. Um, and you're sitting on top, there we go. It's called Harrowing. 
You arrive at noon like a secret agent waiting for a communique. The tour guide stands you in a tiny room off the kitchen and tells you about Willa Cather's real life friend, Annie Pavelka, who she fictioned into Antonia Shimerda. This is you. Is Antonia why you're here now? Earlier this morning, when the darkness still felt like night, you read about a backlit plow, heroic in size, a picture riding on the sun, Cather wrote. You stretched your hand to the empty half of your bed and then to your still flat belly, reasons enough to read all night. Next, maps on your phone, a few taps, one pin, six hours driving minutes. You drove the whole way listening to an audiobook of my Antonia. You were named, Lena, for one of Antonia's closest friends by the woman whose bald head and translucent skin broke your heart long before he did it again. Yet you believe in happy endings. That other Lena sewed her way to San Francisco. Now you face up Annie's root cellar stairs. You imagine her children surging into the sunlight. Imagine that your center stirs. Later, you melt into the grassy divide. You try to become part of Cather's son, air, goodness, knowledge, dissolved into something complete and great. But you're here for that damned heroic plow anyway, and whatever might be written for you on the daylight star, you sit up and watch the angling light. The Nebraska prairie sunset cracks your shriveled heart wide open. The molten disc becomes only a sliver leaving shadowy purple in its wake. You cup your belly and suddenly you're asking Antonia or Annie, should I name her Martha or Lucille after yours? How did you do it? If you could see yourself from afar, you would know that you are the plow, the picture writing your own happiness on the sun. The second piece, um, I, I just lost my sister about a month ago to a long terminal illness to, with metastatic breast cancer. And I actually just wrote this um, a few days after she passed. It's uh, representing the last time that we really uh, walked out to the car together. This is called Carved. Canada geese insist this way behind fat snowflakes. Miocene cliffs drop into today's Columbia River and we pause. A gift? I turn to you bundled up with a knitted cap protecting your bald head from the cho. Beautiful, you breathe and pause your cane punctuated journey to the car. I just love these and your free hand lifts toward the jutting wall of layered mega anim lava flows hundreds of feet up. We stand on Crescent Bar in this moment an island built for two. 15,000 years ago, a glacial lake in Montana burst its ice dam and carved this river even deeper, forming these cliffs in the Gorge Amphitheater just down the way. Younger, more expendable versions of ourselves propped on the hillside there for Lilith Fair, singing along to Cheryl Crow and Sarah McLachlan. Our ignorance is my favorite part the naivete about our whole lives before us and all those endless possibilities. Was it fate or free will? Because right now, while the weeping rain mourns with me, as bewildered as I am by the rush of mere days from geese to your last breath, the hanging fog can be nothing but your crematorium smoke. And the night McLaughlin saying sweet surrender is all I have to give to yesterday's haggard autonomic rasps marking your end. The pathway feels as inevitable as that long ago flood, already as etched as the carved out Columbia River Gorge and the bottomless fissure that is my heart. Thank you. I love that last line there, the bottomless fissure that is my heart. Beautiful. And um, you can read Mary Maxie Jane's um, story of feminist history of you um, in the journal. And uh, thank you, Maxie Jane. Um, and I'm listening to these stories and thinking I'd publish them all again. 
<laughs> so there you go. Um, it's really nice to hear them again, hear them read aloud. It's beautiful. Thank you for being here. And thank you, too, to Jude and my Aunt Miriam and Judy Ireland and uh, Shannon Castor for your wonderful presence and, and being such a beautiful audience. And um, really, really nice. You just, you know, you just kind of make it. You're like the icing on the cake, you know. So, um once again, thank you for these beautiful readings. Um, I, you know, you make you make my job so easy. You know, sitting in these wonderful stories, and it's it's just a delight. So, thank you. Um, keep us submissions are always open at SoFloPojo and um, SoFloPojo.com, and you know, also go check out the great poetry. I have a lot of great poetry in the journal, and essays, and uh, you know, all kinds of good stuff, and. Um, We'll be back next time in a couple of months. And um, so thank you again, Michael McInomera, for your Zoom teching. And um, everybody, drive safely and good night.